Hey, what's going on, good people? It's your pal Terry Bean. I am with legitimately the smartest guy I've ever met. I'm excited to be talking to him. We're going to talk a little bit about the PPP. We're going to talk a little bit about the CARES Act. We're going to talk about what you can do to protect your business and what you can do to protect your family as it pertains to your money. So I just told him and made him laugh. I said, the most genuine way I could prepare for this is to do absolutely nothing. So I'm going to be the voice of questions that I think I need to know and that I think you need to know. And we're going to listen to Mr. Leon Lebrecht. I don't want to go into all the titles and initials after his name. There's a few of them. But uh, as far as finance guys go, this dude is the true dope. Give you one quick example. He just wrote the PPP Act for the state of Michigan. So when they call and say, hey, how does this work? There's some credibility for you. Good day, Mr. Lebrecht. How are you, bud? Hey, Ter. Good to see you, man. Good to be here with you. Uh, weird in the word of uh, word of virtual reality, right? I normally like to be having a long neck with you somewhere, and we can we could talk and chat. So, I'm just I just find it really interesting. It's a it's a whole new paradigm, isn't it? It is indeed, man. Are you uh, are you zoomed out yet? Is that something that's <laughs> been a little too much yet? I've been having fun with my Zoom backgrounds. I think that's really cool. Putting Tiger King on has been always a riot, so I'm enjoying that. And uh, I I can put a Jeopardy screen up, and I can put the White the White House screen up. Um, really, I've been working more than I've ever worked. I've been, I mean, this is, this is my, you know, fertile ground to go play. I get to go play in this, you know, me. So as soon as the act was passed, I read the whole thing. I stayed up, stayed up all night and read it. I started summarizing and I started getting it down. I got it out. I've been writing my articles for Forbes. So I wrote my article for Forbes and uh, that's been crazy. So I, we, we've been doing a lot of stuff on this. I've been working with the state, been working with the CPA association. I've never seen so much happen in a month ever in my life. And I mean, I've been doing this 45 years, been a college professor. Never have I seen what we've seen, ranging from negative oil prices to a bull market and a bear market in one month to a complete upheaval in the tax system and the SBA system and the unemployment system. I mean, it's just, it's the wildest times. The Chinese have a curse. May you live an interesting time. Holy heck, are we an interesting time, Terry? I can't tell you. So anyway, it, yeah. Does it Long make story. your head hurt? Long story. Yeah. <laughs> no, my no. head never hurts except on Saturday mornings. There you but, go. Um, I, I am learning all kinds of weird things. I look forward to the big part of my day is the Amazon truck showing up. I have discovered that the soon as this is off, I am taking you to lunch, dude, and dinner and drinks and <laughs> breakfast. I am going to a restaurant. I'm going to my favorite restaurant. I'm going to tip the hell out of everybody. And I am going to go keep doing a fire uh, glass of wine with my wife at the fire. We have a fire pit. We almost never used it. We've now been doing a fire on every nice evening. We have a glass of wine down by the fire and the dogs come down and we listen to the creek and we don't talk about news and it's great. I love that. So I, I, I'm, I'm finding I've got new roommate rules. I got new digital rules. And boy, am I glad I knew you because you taught me a lot of this digital stuff. I'd have been still sitting here writing letters with a fountain pen probably. Right. With a candle. I can only imagine. Yeah. yeah. That's it. And the green eye shades. Yeah. The feather actually. No. The quill. No. I, uh, I think it's exciting, man. I, it's interesting how many things you just kind of laid out from jumping off points. But let's start with some really good news. Let's start. Uh, one of the things that I you talked about earlier was the PPP loan. You asked if I got it. I said I didn't even apply. And then I said, what's the point? And then you said, the point is? The point is, this afternoon, they just upped it to $659 billion from $349 billion. And they also upped the EIDL grants from $10 billion to $20 billion. And agriculture employees can be in there as well. And then there's a set aside for deposit institutions. So they put more money in the till, a lot more money in the till. So is that an additional $660 billion or is that including the initial 349? And then what another, is EIDL? It's another, three, uh, it's another 310. Okay. Yeah, we're learning all kinds of new acronyms. I'm going to go get an acronym dictionary and publish it, the COVID acronym dictionary. Yes, please um, do. Yeah. But, so there's two kinds of loans here. Um, there's the Paycheck Protection Program, which is probably the closest thing to free money that I've seen. And that's where you get a loan without any loan guarantees, without a loan application. You have a loan application, but no application fees, no loan guarantees, no uh, correlation to any other loans you have. It's not like any other normal SBA loan. It's called a 7A loan. And you use your average payroll. You get two and a half times your average payroll plus some other expenses as the loan. So 1% loan, six months, no payments. But if you use it to maintain payroll for the eight weeks past the loan date, 
uh, and you, you can show, demonstrate the amount to the degree you sustain payroll and some of your other expenses, the loan is forgiven tax-free. Wow. So, you know, I have a business, you know, I, it's not my business, but I have a client with a business, 50 grand is their average payroll. They got a $100,000 paycheck protection loan program. We're accounting very scrupulously. They're going to get most of that given to them for free. They're going to get like 80,000 bucks free, Terry. And that's, that's huge. It's a huge thing. The other end of the scale that we're seeing is this EIDL, the emergency disaster loan. And that's a different one. That's a real SBA loan. So the PPP, I'm going to tell you, you should go to your bank, go apply for the loan. Go get it. And, and we can talk about the messes. There have been messes. Wells Fargo was only giving it to their big clients. And, you know, and, and Ruth Chris's steakhouse was getting it. And Steak Shack gave theirs back. And everybody goes, I don't believe this. I go, you think there's gonna, not going to be any problems with a government program that was created in three days? I mean, it's just <laughs> like, you know, give me a break. But uh, the good news is there's more money back in the system. And if anybody wants, we've got all kinds of COVID resources up on the state site, myppp.com, including some comparison charts and application things and where to find a lender. And that's the program that I helped the Michigan Association of CPAs do for the state. Uh, and it tells about the program and about how it works. Uh, yeah, there's been some abuses, but if you have a small business, here's the wild part. A sole proprietor can get one of these loans. A, 40, a 501c3 organization, a church can go get it. So you got a church and your church is, you know, of course, imagine having a church. No one's going to church. You know, you have virtual church service. That's what we're doing. But I mean, there's not, you know, there's no, there's no way to actually get to it. How do you, what do you do with your contributions? There aren't any. You still got your utilities and other things. You laid off your employees, but a church can get it. A sole proprietor can get it. An Uber driver can get one. So this is available to just about everybody. And it's the equivalent of an unemployment grant for the business itself. And it's, I, it is a really good program, and it's a really important part of us getting into a recovery. And so, you know, I'm suggesting let's not be stoic, you know, get out there and try to get this. And, you know, it, you know, you can't, it's weird. The application process is just prove that you are eligible and you get the loan. You don't have to go through credit reports and all this other stuff. The proving part comes on the way back when you get the forgiveness. But worst case scenario, you got a 1% loan. You want a 1% loan for your business, Terry? I do now. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. I've sold you. So yeah, right. I'm telling you, go, go out and get that PPP. Uh, and it just, this is just broke today. I mean, to, on the, this is on the 21st. We're talking. It broke the afternoon of the 21st. The news. Yeah. This is content so fresh. You could eat it raw, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. That's, sushi. It's like, it's like economic sushi. It's exactly right. Yeah. Cause you don't want like three day old sushi. Don't do that. You know, Homer Simpson. No, no. Right. So that's, that's fascinating and really exciting. So in the list of who's eligible, um, gosh, it seems like it might have been easier to say who wasn't eligible. Um, it is easier to say who isn't eligible. Uh, anybody who had a business is eligible that had less than 500 employees with the loophole for Ruth Chris and a couple hotels and stuff like that. Um, everybody else is pretty much eligible in a business sense. And that could be if you ran your own business by yourself, if you were a self a lawyer and you just hung out a shingle, or if you were a you know, you were a, a little small restaurant with five people working in it or an ice cream shop. And I've had everybody from ice cream shops to CPA firms, to law firms, to all kinds of folks talking to me about this thing. And we're seeing, you know, all over the map, trucking companies and, every, you know, literally anybody running a business could get it. You can't get it if you're an association. So associations and PACs can't get it. And I like this one. You can't get it if you're the president, the vice president, or a member of Congress. <laughs> which is That's okay with me. That's yeah. okay with me. I'm okay with that rule. No. So, and, and if you, uh, if you get the loan, you can't screw up an existing collective bargaining agreement during the period of loan. So if you've got union employees, you can't break the contract during the eight week period, which is fair. That seems, yeah, that's that seems hey, fair. Like I mean, maintain I, status quo for two months. Yeah, you can that's it. all it is. It's here. Keep, keep your business running. We don't want to run people, you know, out of business. That's what we want. We don't want to do. Was there, it seemed like there was some hesitation to actually approve this second round. Did it actually go smoother than it, than it seemed like, or it was, was it because one side, the Republicans wanted to just expand the PPP. So everybody wanted to expand the PPP. Okay. They added on a section for the hospitals and actually Terry, I've been digging into this because if you noticed on the 21st today, Beaumont laid off a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. and what I've discovered from my friends in the healthcare business is it's terrible to be a hospital right now. You think that, Oh, while well, coronavirus is the hospital, it must be crazy. No, they're empty. No one's going in for stents. 
no one's going in for coronary. No one's going in for, uh, you know, for uh, orthopedic surgery. No one's going in anywhere. They're not going in for any normal surgeries. In fact, my friend who runs one of the big hospitals here, he says, I can't believe it. Normally, we would have like 270 heart attacks a day. We're having 12. What are these people doing? You know, and you'd think they'd have more heart attacks in the stress. You'd think Absolutely. there'd be more strokes. He goes, we're not having the many strokes. We're not having the heart attacks. We're not having anything. Either everybody's scared into health you know, or, or, they're, or, they're, or they're just staying at home having a heart attack and not doing it. But it's, it's wild. And this is going to change our healthcare system. So the, plan, the, the, the act, this new extension, throws in more money for the hospitals. And believe me, that is going to change. I think that's going to change a lot. I mean, I uh, doctors are going to do telemedicine, uh, you know, small practitioners might be going out of business. Who knows? I don't know where it's going to go with healthcare. Well, it's, uh, I've said there's three things that I'd like to see us fundamentally reform as a result of this healthcare, right? And how that's handled, how that's insured and the, the whole litany of that yeah. education, which we're obviously seeing change. You know, I, I know your children are uh, beyond college age at this point. Um, Mine is, mine's in high school. So now she's at five hours of virtual stuff uh, a day. And I think that's going to be an interesting transition moving forward. And then just fundamentally how, how Congress and how the executive branch and how that all operates. Um, I, you know, I've just, it's got it. We got to do something, right? I think we're, I think we're all woke up to the fact that things are it's time to make some changes. So I, I think you're right on all of those. Um, the healthcare system is going to change itself really, really rapidly. I mean, my friends in the business are telling me the things that we thought were going to happen in a decade are happening in two months. Wow. And so, you know, I mean, you know, just take a simple one, like everybody's saying the hospitals weren't ready for this. And, and I didn't know this. An N95 mask has a two year shelf life. So if you have N95 masks in your inventory, you have to throw them all away if you didn't have a pandemic. Well, quick, by a quick question, how many pandemics have we had in the last hundred years? And the answer is none. I mean, we've had 12 mild epidemics of, you know, the SARS and some of the other stuff, but nothing like this. So you would have wasted for every one of those 50 times, you would have wasted the N95 masks. You know, he said, how many ventilators do you need in a hospital? He said, normally we need two, you know, in a big hospital, we don't need 30. So I'm going to go buy all these expensive pieces of equipment and sit them there and then raise the price of your health insurance to do it. And it, it does belie a whole question of how do we do this? You know, and what's going to happen now with telemedicine? What's going to happen with other things? What's going to happen with liabilities? You know, and in, in, think of the cascade, Terry. You, you, you mentioned education. How would you like to be a landlord in East Lansing right now? You know, and, and like you, you mentioned my kids, one's getting his PhD. He was supposed to be walking for his graduation next Friday. He was, we were supposed to go to the graduation and have him walk for his doctorate. And I was so excited and I had the present all picked out. Now I drank it. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all going to be a really interesting thing of what happens now with higher ed. And a cool thing, a friend of mine in D.C., I, I deal a lot with D.C., well, works at a great big CPA firm. He came in and said, hey, I can get into Georgetown without taking the LSATs, Georgetown Law School. What do you think? I said, do it, dude. What's wrong with you? And then that, that's another end that we're going to see is that you're going to see a whole bunch of shakeout. And I, and I call this an evolution, a quick evolution. I, I've always studied Darwin, and Darwin never said it's a survival of the fittest. He said it's a survival of the most adaptable organism. And I've always said from business owner standpoints, there's two frogs in a pond, a bullfrog and a leopard frog, and there's a finite amount of mosquitoes to eat. How much better does one have to be than the other to dominate the pond? And the answer is one-tenth of one percent. All you got to do is eat a little bit more of the mosquitoes and you win. And so coming out of this kind of thing is who's going to be adaptable? You know, we're going to have fewer hospitals in the United States that by in a year from now. There's going to be bad, hospitals going bankrupt. And the ones that are going to survive are the ones that are adaptable. And we're going to have fewer colleges probably because they're going to be online ones. And it's going to be different. And I, some of us are going to find out online works. I send everybody. Do you know you can take classes at Harvard for free and at Stanford and MIT? I send a link to everybody. Just go take them. You don't have to take them for credit. Go take a lecture. You can go sit in the lecture at Harvard. And it's free. And it's, we may find out. Well, yeah, gosh, I don't have to go to the East Coast School and I don't have to hire a guy for 100000 bucks to get my kid into USC because it doesn't matter because they can learn all this stuff anyway. You're one of the people who taught me you can learn things online and do things all the way around the horn. It's been valuable experience for me. So I don't know. I see it. I see abrupt changes there. I do think the democracy will survive. I think our system was built on a chaos. It was built on overtaking things and we've been through lots of things. You know, if you go through the United States, I'm studying right now trying to come up with the recovery. 
I've been studying economic data of the whole world for, uh, for basically the longest time period I can on their GDP. So I'm studying what happened to the Ebola virus in Rwanda, and I'm talking about post-war Japan and post-war Germany. But the interesting part is, if you just look at the United States from 1917 to 1929, we had a pandemic, 25 million people died. We had a war, 25 million people died. You know, if I go look at the Civil War, post-Civil War, I can tell you that was a pretty bad event. We had just about ripped the Union completely apart. We killed more people proportionally to population than any war in history. And we, we came out of it. So right, I have confidence that the democracy, that the, that the republic shall survive in some form. And I have confidence the economy shall survive in some form. But the question is, what form? It's an interesting thing, right? Not to play Monday morning quarterback, but is, you know, what's more important right now, life or economy? Right? How do you and how do you how do you balance between the two? Is there if you were if you were in charge of all that goes on, right? Maybe you're not worried about the the pandemic side as much because you're a smart guy and you would rely on smart people in virus and infectious disease and take some advice there. But in terms of the economy, is is dumping a twelve hundred dollar stimulus check into everybody's account in the the first month the way to go? Is there can you, can you guess it a different way or a better way to do that? Or is that just outside the scope of the conversation? No, it's, it, we all, first of all, it's interesting when you're in this kind of mode, anybody's, you know, people say, well, you're an expert. I say, can't be, I'm, I'm an expert for four weeks. Right. I, I get four weeks of expertise. So I, I've, 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 I've had four weeks to think about this and none to think about it before. I've never thought about this before. Although I, I did see the movie, The Stand, and I went back and bought it on DVD so I could watch it. So, and, and if you want to be terrified and think, well, it could get worse, go watch The Stand by Stephen King. It's great. Or read the book, which is 1,400 pages long. And this so, will anyway, make you feel better then. Yeah, yeah, then you can cheer up by reading No Country for Old Men. But um, the, the aspect, you ask a great question. We have pulled every economic stop out to try to save this. But I want, to, I want your, all our listeners to remember something. We may not all get COVID. We probably won't. In fact, I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain we won't all get COVID. We all will pay for it. We're all going to pay for this. We are now tuned up to about $5 trillion. And Terry, if I doubled the tax rate in the United States, if I doubled it, I can't pay for that. I can't pay for it. In how long so, a time frame? Is that, I mean, we're talking years, decades, generations? Years, years I can't do it by doubling the tax rate. Here's the example. In 1916, the tax rate in the United States was 15%. And in 1917, when we had the Spanish flu epidemic, it jumped to 63%. That's the highest tax bracket. At the end of World War II, which gave us the highest economic growth in United States history, highest, fastest economic growth in U.S. history, the maximum tax rate in 1945 was 94%. 94%. So everyone will pay for this. Now, you asked me a question if I were the emperor, and I, I do fantasize about that from time to time, because there's places I'd like to have, you know, as part of my emperor, my empire. <laughs> Mackinac Island in Hawaii would be two of them. But um, if, I, if I'm going to be the emperor, you do have to make an economic decision. And we do this all the time. We make an economic decision that people can smoke, because it's more important to let the cigarette industry stay in place than the people die from lung cancer. We, we allowed it. It's part of our decision. We made, an, we made a social decision that way. We made a social decision that obesity is acceptable. We made social decisions that people who have heart attacks can get medical insurance and have be covered irrespective all the time. We made decisions that, you know, you can, you can drive a car in a certain way and do things. We, we are obliged to have the safety of our population, but we have always made compromises on the, on the economic trade-off of it. And I think what we're going to discover on this, I, I, when I first looked at the virus, I was, you know, I, I'm a math nerd. You know that. Our, our listeners don't know that, but I, I think I, you know, I was born in an, an Excel spreadsheet, which back then was called a 14 column. It was done with quill pens. But um, when I first looked at it, the Chinese were expressing their fatality rate using a quadratic equation. And it was, it was I, I talked to a friend of mine and he said, yeah, you're right. It's a quadratic equation. And we looked at it and he goes, I bet I can predict, he said, he was smarter than I am. He goes, I can predict the, the fatality rate for the next seven days. And he did exactly, almost exactly. And I said, well, that's stupid. You know, infectious diseases aren't quadratic equations. They're exponential equations. It's exponential. And he said, yeah, I know. They're, they're not telling us the truth. It's, it's mathematical proof they're not telling us the truth. And he said, watch, the, the fatalities are going to jump to this. And he was, again, almost exactly right. Suppose I told you, though, then this, I wrote this in a Forbes column. I said, what if, what if we looked at the amount of 
numbers. And we said, China said there's 80,000 people have it and 4,000 people died. That's the number we're looking at. I said, the 80,000, the 4,000 people that died, that's an accurate number. We know how many people died. So let, let's say for purposes of our discussion, we know exactly how many people died. What we don't know is how many people had the virus. So what we're finding already, and it's, as, soon as, as soon as that aircraft carrier, the Roosevelt, came out, and they, took the, they tested all the soldiers, all the sailors on it, I said to my wife, I said, there's 60 times more people have the virus than they have listed as a number. And she goes, no. CDC was coming out and saying, we just tested LA County. There's 58 times more people that have the virus than we think. So now if I say to you, Tara, look, if you get this COVID, we have this COVID virus, there's a 2% chance you'll get it and die. You're going, hell no, I'm not going anywhere. If I say, look, there's this COVID virus and 30 million people have had it and 20,000 people have died, that's eight tenths of 1%, which means it's about twice as fatal as the flu. You might say, you know what? I'll go to the office. I'll stay six feet away from people. I'll wear a mask. I think that's where we're going to get to. We're going to get toward that level of we're going to find out once we test. And this, there's where we failed this test. This is where we failed this whole thing. We should have tested everybody right off the get-go. And we should have just had Google and Apple tell us where everybody is. So if you had the virus, we could find out who you were talking to, just like you can find out on Facebook or everything else. Heck, my app, my computer, my smartphone knows where I am all the time. It's always telling me stuff. Why don't you just tell Apple, tell us everybody who's been to China and tell us where they are. I mean, it, I know it sounds big, brother. We could have done it. New Zealand did that. New Zealand went and did an, an, an effective test on everybody who'd been everywhere. They tested just about everybody in the country. You know how many people have died in New Zealand, Terry? Hmm. 12. 12? 12. I mean, I know it's not a very large country, but that's an infinitesimal number. It's a tiny number. New Zealand's a small but beautiful country, but they had, they had it down pat. How long We're ago did they find start? Out, hmm? They when started they, right away. They, yeah. they did like, okay, this is going on. Here's what we need to do. Well, New Zealand's close to China. They have access to China. So as soon as China came out, they said, we're testing. Same thing. South Korea, same thing. Way lower fatality rate. Tested, isolated, kept it out there. You know, it's interesting that you bring up the point because I, I, people are always asking, why are we testing? Why is testing matter? Why is testing important? And, and I, to me, that speaks for itself. But it, the smart question is, how are we tracing people? Right. And, and you forget that we carry the ultimate tracer around with us every damn place we go. We're already yep. traced. Why is that? That seems like a solved problem that people aren't really talking about. Right. Why don't you just find everybody had the virus and go check where they've been with their cell phone? Huh. You know where they've been? And then you can see everybody they've been with and go test all those people. You don't have to test every single human being. If I'm living up in, you know, Algoma County and I haven't seen anybody for six weeks, which I lived in Algoma County, maybe that would be the case, you know, then I, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a risky person. But maybe if I've been working at a Home Depot, maybe I am. And maybe somebody in the Home Depot came in and said, oh, somebody came in the Home Depot on your shift. We can find this out. And the weird part is, and you know this, the digital marketing machine of the United States and the world already knows all this information. Well, and that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so fear sells, right? The clickbait is fantastic and news is uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to call it shady. I know that there are journalists that have integrity still, but I, I think the model's broken. Is there a way that we can actually go back to the individual paying for news as opposed to corporate funding and advertisers so that we're actually getting real information as opposed to uh, whatever we're being fed? Boy, I don't know. I would like it, but I remember when we used to pay for it. And then when we figured out that advertising pays and gets us the message, you know, you're buying the eyeballs and buying the ears and eyes of the people. And uh, I think it's going to take a change in consumer behavior, which unfortunately in this world of digital, it's going to be worse, not better. I mean, we're consuming more digital. Although again, after I take you to lunch, I'm sure I'm turning my phone off because I'm, <laughs> I'm going to turn my computer off too. We're, we're done. Yeah, yeah that's we're uh, done. I, wanna, I, I can't I see how it zoom bombed. It hasn't happened yet. I keep waiting for all the zoom bombing. I keep yeah. hearing about like, like if someone just threw a bunch of naked pictures in this, I, I like it could spice it up. I don't, it could spice know. it up. I mean, it would be good. I could, you know, or I could, I could do my virtual background if that would make you feel better. I'll, I'll, I don't like virtual backgrounds. Okay. I'll, let me, let me get a good one here. Huh? I'll, here. How's that? The, look at you. That's very, very. So you nice. asked if I was in charge, what would I do? You, and I, and I, I didn't round about the answer. Um, if I was in charge, I would have probably had to make an economic decision. 
and I would have said, this is how it goes. You know, we, we, we might have to, there will be people losing their lives. It's going to happen anyway. And people lose their lives in a flu epidemic or they lose their lives in all the other things I alluded to. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things, industrial accidents and all kinds of other stuff that happens that we, we have to make some kind of a compromise. You know, there is a level where you say, I just, you know, you got to say there's, there's a, some limit and you say, this is what we're going to have to do. And, you know, you would have to make that decision. So I'm, I'm leaning more on you can't kill the economy and starve everyone to death to save some people from dying of COVID. And, and we just can't do it. You can't, we can't starve our all to death in order to get around the other end of it. It's just, it, it has to happen. I do worry that we're going to get in this the, them and us thing of the people who are, have the antibodies. So if my, if my number, if my theory is correct, which completely could be wrong, like I said, I got four weeks to give a theory. So in my four week theory, 30, 40 million people have already had COVID. So they should be allowed to do whatever they want to do because they can't carry the virus anymore because they have the antibodies. So what's going to happen then if you and I have been being good, safe people and they already had it, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's the weird question where we get into, you know, the medical question we get into. I'm more worried about the economics though, Terry. I'm trying to figure out what this recovery looks like. Are we, are we going into a V or a W or a U or an L? God forbid an L. But, you know, what's, what's it look like and where do we get, how do we get from there to here? And are we going to look back at this and go, you know, that was pretty serious and it was terrible. But, man, we overreacted a little bit. We really put everything to it. We shut the whole country down. It cost us trillions and trillions of dollars. I mean, we lost $9 trillion in the stock market decline, virtually. And we lost a couple trillion dollars in GDP. That's an enormous, I mean, th those are numbers that aren't even other countries. That's like, you know, it's, it, we, 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 lost, we lost almost all the countries of the world in terms of our economic decline in a couple of months. Yeah, not, I mean, not really, not even, right? We're, yeah. we're talking, we're not two full months in, technically. Right. I mean, right. we kind of are, but not really. So you, you mentioned the V, the W, the L, and I know that that's crystal clear to you, but I, those are letters. They don't have anything to do with economics to me. So right. can, you, can you say what that means? And do you have a, I, I'm curious as to what you might prognosticate as to how that goes. Well, I'm working on a deep research project right now. So I got my, my folks helping me. We're working on what, what economic situations happened in prior crises. So what was it like to be in Germany after World War I, World War II? What was it like to be in the United States after the Spanish influence outbreak? What was Spain like after the Spanish influence outbreak? What was Japan like after World War II? What was China like after World War II? And so we can find other places, maybe the good news or the bad news, there were times when things were worse. There's lots of times when things are worse. So if you see that, there's plenty of times when things are worse, and we always got out of it. So that's the good news. The way we got out of it, the shape of the recovery generally fell into one of four letters. Luckily for us, almost always fell into one of three letters. It was either a V, where it went down and bounced right back up. So just think of a letter V, and that's what we want. Everybody should want a V. That's what we want. We want a V. Everybody goes back to work. Some miracle happens. Magic occurs. And, you know, tomorrow, Johnson & Johnson or somebody invents the vaccine. It's a vaccine that can be administered in a lifesaver. You don't even need a shot. They can have it produced by, you know, Mars Candy Company. They stick it in a, you know, little pineapple-flavored lifesaver, and you take the lifesaver, and you won't get COVID. And everybody goes back to work tomorrow, and we're good. And we're only out a couple trillion bucks. And the people who are unemployed that made less than 21 bucks an hour are mad because now they have to go back to work as opposed to getting a better unemployment check. And those of us who got the PPP are happy because we got forgiven loans, and the rest of us who pay taxes will be sad. Okay, that's the V. If we had normal recessions, that's our most normal size of a recession. So V, down and up. So 1991, no one even remembers it. It was a little recession, down and up, bang, out. A U is when we go down and stay down for a while. So that was the one we just, the big ugly one we just went through. That was 07 to 09. Went down, stayed down. Things kept getting worse, kept getting worse, kept getting worse until March 9th, and then finally came back out of it because we had accelerated trillions of dollars of mortgage-backed securities, and we had let the whole financial system blow up. So that was, a, that was a U, and it didn't cause property damage per se, but it certainly caused economic damage, terrible economic damage. And, and this one will be worse faster, but it'll probably get better faster too. Okay. And then we have a W like we had in, in 1980, 1981, and that's when we have a V-shaped recession, a slight recovery, and another V-shaped recession. And that's what I call the reinfection. 
And I like Dr. Fauci. I think he's one of the, you know, the more mature adults in the room when we listen to him. And he's warning that if we all go out and start running around together and don't have some way of protecting ourselves, we could have a reinfection in September. We could be right back in the same boat in September. We're just going to rip. It's, it'll be deja vu. It'll be like that movie Groundhog Day. And we're going to be living this over again, all over. So, and then finally, the L is when it just goes down and stays down. I don't see that one, Terry. And um, the goes down and stays down would be if we sequester the whole country for nine months, we'd probably get rid of the virus, but we'd kill the country. We'd kill the economy. So it's which patient, this was back to my emperor question, which patient are you going to kill? Are you going to kill the economy patient, which kills everybody, or are you going to kill the certain group of people that can't, you know, that are going to have the COVID virus? Uh, the interesting part is the COVID virus keeps going down now. We're, we're not, it's not that we're curing it, but the more people that get it, the more people are immune to it. So when we started this thing, no one had it. So everybody was susceptible. And now we found out, well, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not a doctor and I don't even play one on TV. But we found out that maybe, you know, 30, 40, 50 million people have already had it. And, you know, I know in our own case, we have somebody in the office. I'm absolutely certain she had it. My nephew had it. I know he had it because he was in ICU. But I'm almost certain my assistant had it because she had every one of the symptoms. They just didn't have her in because she wasn't, you know, she wasn't having one of the symptoms to bring her into ICU. And luckily, she's better and she cured, you know, came through and came through it. So I think there's a lot of people had it. And that's going to change the way we do things. I don't think we're going to have a V. I think it's going to be a U. So I think this is going to be a little bit longer, and I think the pain we're going to pay for is going to be a lot longer. We're, we are just starting to pay for the cost of QE that we did back in 2008. We just did QE on super steroids. We did QE that's beyond QE. We did fiscal stimulus that's beyond fiscal stimulus. I mean, think about where we were three months ago. Fix the damn roads. Let's go out and get some stuff done. Let's get infrastructure spending. Let's build, you know, we were bitching about spending $10 billion on a wall. Mm -hmm. We just spent $2 trillion on nothing. We don't even have a wall to show for it. We have some respirators, maybe. That's about it. We have nothing. We have paid, we paid $350 billion for businesses to stay open and not have their employees around. We paid $250 billion for people to go on unemployment. We paid $100 billion to everybody in the United States just to give them a check so they didn't starve to death and go riot in the streets. I mean, so if, if we're looking at this payback, the world has flipped completely on its economic head, and we're looking at a completely different set of stuff now. It's a different world, and we just got to get used to that. We're going to have to understand that, and I'm just saying, okay, what's next? You know, yeah, we'll get out of this. That I'm pretty confident. I'm almost 100% certain we'll get out of this, medically and economically. It's going to cost us a lot to get out of it. That's what I think. So you just mentioned that we paid $2 trillion. Where did that money come from? Like, because it, it didn't really exist before. So how does that happen? Oh, you know, it's, it's really funny. And I'm going to say something that will be scary. Take a dollar bill out of your wallet and look at the little thing on the left-hand side of it. It basically says, this is good. And then take a $20 bill out and look at the left-hand side and it says, this is good. And then take a hundred dollar bill out if you got one and it says, this is good. I know my wallet's still full because I haven't bought anything. So I don't, you know, mine, mine's got completely full of all the money in it. But you believe it's good and it's good. So the Fed just can create money. The Fed can say to all the banks, you have $350 billion, go lend it out. And that's exactly what they did. They pushed the magic Fed button. And the magic Fed button says, this is good. And right now the rest of the world believes this is good. And as long as everybody believes that and they go, wow, the strongest economy in the world with the biggest army in the world said this is good, so it must be good. But we, there is no money. Money is a myth. And we all believe it. It's a myth that we all believe. It's a fiction we believe. And as long as we all subscribe to that fiction, we're okay. We believe in corporations. Corporations don't exist. They're just a legal fiction. Somebody got together and said, hey, I can make a company and it's going to be treated like a person. Oh, okay not a person. Go find me, you know, go find me AT&T and show me the, show me AT&T. You can show me the people that work at AT&T. You can show me the shareholders of AT&T. You can show me a whole bunch of pieces of paper that's AT&T. They're just pieces of paper. That's just the fiction. So we live in a society, the whole kind of, the world does. The world lives in a society of fiction. And as long as we all believe the fictions, it works. So if we believe the Fed can tell us today that they did, there's 210 more billion dollars. My God, there is. We can believe that because they said it. It's a fiction. Wow. 
So it's I like you the idea. Have a drink now, I think. Don't you? I'm, I'm serious. After that, I'm thinking maybe a martini would be up. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. If they have anything strong enough in the house, man. I want some Everclear all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah I'm going. Just yeah, that'd be good. Put in my eyelids. Um, <laughs> it's uh, that's a scary, scary thought. You know, so you go back to the idea of, you know, we're we're certainly overspending uh, our allowance at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, who does who does that debt get called into, right? Who are we repaying it to? Forget about the fact that we obviously are going to be repaying it forever. Where does it where does that money go back to? What the central banks have been doing now is buying their own debt. So the Fed buys the Treasury's debt. So the Treasury issues the debt, the Fed buys it. And as long as that, as, you know, copacetic arrangement exists, we're good. We, we still have to pay the interest on the debt. And then the long run is, if you're, if you're Alan Greenspan, you inflate your way out of the debt. So eventually you just shrink it away and it goes away and your economy grows. So in the theory, the theory that works, that we like to believe in the fiction, the fiction says, you issue all this money, you stimulate the economy, people go back to work. Let's, let's go back to my hypothetical, the V. We get the V. It's a yep. beautiful V, comes back out, everybody goes back to work. We have all this extra money in the system. Everybody now is happy. They go back to, we can go to a ball game. We can go to a concert. We can do all the stuff we want to do, go to restaurants. And we got some money and say, oh, it wasn't all that bad. We all start paying taxes. We go back to paying our taxes. The economy starts taking off. The money we're going to go spend on infrastructure starts to take off. And we all get wealthier and the wealth effect lifts everybody up. And the rising boat rises all tides. We get 2 or 3% inflation. Everybody makes a little bit more money. And we pay back that debt with littler dollars. That's the ideal scenario. Maybe we devalue our currency a little bit. Maybe we lower the dollar against other currencies and make our stuff cheaper so everybody buys our stuff. That's a possibility too. But some way, shape, or form, you either, you either have to tax to spend it, you have to default on it, which doesn't make any sense. You can't default on it. And you got to pay the interest on it. So there's a, there's a question that comes into play. And a question I've asked two Fed chairs and never gotten the answer of is what happens if the Treasury, if the Fed forgives the debt to the Treasury? You know, but an example of that, Terry, is Japan. Japan's been running this giant debt. They're running 230% of their GDP in debt. Wow. And, and they've done this since 1989. Now, I might also show you that their purchasing power per person has gone down steadily since 1989. So it's a long death by paper cuts thing that happens. The paper being $100 bills. <laughs> right. So you, get, you get death by paper cuts over the long, 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 long term. And so the answer is your kids pay for it. My kids pay for it. They pay for it with a, maybe a lesser society. They don't get the same prosperity we had. They don't get the same opportunities because the government saddled with 126% of GDP in debt. That's what I think we're going to have by the time this is done. 126% of GDP, exactly identical to 1946, exactly identical to the spot when we had a 94% debt. Is that coincidence or is that just how math works? Um, math works that when you have um, an economy, think of World War II. We, I mean, Detroit, man, we were building B-24 liberators one an hour. Arsenal of one democracy, baby. Arsenal of democracy. We're building one an hour. So you're doing that, and you're and, and the, actually the good or the bad news, and my, my uh, uncle was a tail gunner on a B-24. So with a B-24, you either get it, and it flies and comes back, or you get it, and it gets shot down, and you need another one. And if you shoot it down and there's another one, you lose a couple of guys on the plane, which is terrible. My uncles did get shot down, but he didn't die. And uh, you, you go through and you say, okay, well, you know, we blew up a bomber. We'll go get another bomber. And that's actually really good for the economy. Wars are great for the economy. The end of wars are not good for the economy. So I was thinking about this. In World War II, my dad was in it. He got to come home. So dad came back from Germany, all happy, all happy to see my mom. I know I came out of that. So it was, you know, it was, you know, we, we have a baby boom going on. He bought a house. I mean, that was the things he did. He came back from the war and he quit running. He bought a house. He bought two cars, had another kid. I mean, that was, that was what my dad wanted to do coming out of World War II. He came home. We're going to leave home. We're going to get out of this thing and get out of our homes and go do something. So there's no damage that we have to fix. We've had a waterless tsunami that's, that's wiped out the economies of 50 states and 138 countries with no, no economic damage, with no physical damage. Not a, not a house got wrecked. Nothing got wrecked. All that got wrecked is, you know, our economy. And so we got it. We, we're going to have to pay that back. And that's probably the scariest thing. It's an interesting thing. You know, it's funny you bring up war a couple of times. I, I, I actually wrote this all out. And it, in one of those moments of clarity, just hit the lead last night. 
but uh, the the analogy of this medical war that we're fighting against an invisible enemy Mm -hmm. um i think about our history and i think you know we've been in afghanistan for 19 years now and that seems like an endless and tireless war uh you know when we went over to the middle east they weren't really wars they were conflicts or operations um we've had this war on drugs for decades that's been let's call it fruitless to say the least uh the korean war the vietnam war i don't think we won either of those um you have to go back to like 1945 to when we actually could claim a v in a in a war and maybe like everything being a war we shouldn't keep talking about that because clearly we're not that good at war and it just seems to cost us a giant sum of money in either preparedness or a giant sum of people and why do we keep using that as an analogy well probably because we got on 12,000 years of experience at it. So it's, a, it's probably the most handy anecdote around. Um, we've been fighting wars since we had a first couple villages where we threw rocks at each other. So I think we've, you know, we, we found it to be a great historical ba- back, backstop that we can go do. It's almost like a um, pastime. Yeah, <laughs> Let, let's go have a war. Um, there are wars that have victories and there are also wars that don't make any sense. You know, the Peloponnesian Wars didn't make sense. And they all wondered why they did them and why were we involved in those? You know, there's a Thucydides had, you know, the whole thing with Sicily. They didn't even want to have it, and they ended up having it. But in, the, the difference in this in a war is that we are having a conflict with a thing, and we're not having a conflict with another entity or another nation. And my first rule is, you know, it's always about the money. You know, and I put a period between any of those. It's always about the money. And in this case, you know, it, I, I go back to what's the money in this case. The, the money in this case is we can get a whole bunch of money out of Washington, put it in people's hands, and they can all, you know, look at us as heroes, the Washingtonians as heroes, and we can solve this problem. We can save lives. And it will be interesting to see, Terry, when we're done, how many lives we saved and how much it costs per life. You know, let's say that, let's say that by doing this, we save 100,000 lives by having sequestration, shutting down the economy, shutting down everything else. We save 100,000 more people than we would have saved. Right? It's probably a way bigger number. It's probably a way bigger number. But if it's $100,000 and it costs us $4 trillion, with 100,000 people, it costs us $4 trillion. That was pretty damn expensive. That was really expensive. I mean, that's, so that's a question you got to really ask yourself is, how much are you willing to pay? And I know somebody will say, Religious-wise, all lives are invaluable. They're infinitely valuable. I agree with that. That's you know, especially if it's mine or my family. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, no amount of money will tell, will replace it. I go with that. But I mean, it's just it, it, it's an interesting, you know, and maybe an awkward question we ask ourselves: uh, How much? How much would you pay to save a hundred thousand more people if everybody in the United States suffers a hundred thousand dollars, or fifty thousand dollars, or eighty thousand dollars, or whatever? I mean. Think it out. We're at four trillion. We're pushing four trillion right now. We got three hundred thirty-eight million people in the country. Do the math. My how calculator doesn't go that big, and I'm not <laughs> yeah. sure how many zeros that is, Leon. I don't. Yeah. I don't think in those kind of numbers. There's, there's twelve in the trillions. So to put it that way, <laughs> the millions have six, and the trillions have twelve. So that'll put. It's a big, big, big. It's big. a big number, man. Yes, it's That's... a huge number, you know. And I, I, I do think that out, and it's, it's, it's a tough question. For us. Make you know, there's a couple your... more things in this CARES Act we ought to just touch on with people. I think yeah. you might want to know them, if you don't sure. mind. No, you know, please. Off on great philosophy, and I always do this with them. Um, and then we're in the absence of alcohol, which is strange. <laughs> it turns out it's not the booze after all. Who knew? <laughs> yeah, I always thought it was. Um, uh, there are some things they did with IRAs. Uh, if you're over 72 or you inherited an IRA, you don't have to take the distribution this year. That's a good thing for people. Give them some tax opportunities to be able to potentially do Roths or other things. Um, there is the ability for you to take $100,000 out of your 401k plan or your IRA without a penalty, and you can pay it back within three years. So if you're a business owner, like a lot of my clients are, small business owner, large business owner, you got a bad year, but you need hundred grand, take that out of your 401k plan, you got three years to pay it back, or you could declare it this year against your losses and not pay taxes. Uh, net operating loss rules got suspended, and you can now carry back net operating losses. The excess loss limitation rules got suspended, so you can now use those against your other income. Interest expense limitations got lifted, so those are good. So there are some things for business owners that we ought to be thinking of. I have been telling everybody one thing, Terry. With a business owner, it's the most important thing is put your own oxygen mask on first. You know, we go fly in a plane, and what do they say? In the event of an emergency, oxygen mask will descend from the top from the ceiling. 
always put your own mask on first and then assist others. You should do that. All of us, if we're running a business, owe it. And I'm a business owner too, like you. And, and I have, you know, we have 91 employees and it, yeah, I want to help them. I worry about them all the time and I want to help our 4,000 clients. But if I don't take care of myself, I can't take care of anybody. So I've been telling my business owners, get a power of attorney, healthcare power of attorney for yourself, get one for your mom, your kids, just in case, you know, if this infection hurts you, we want to make sure somebody can make decisions on your behalf. Check your health insurance, check your HSAs, get those done. Same thing, mom and parents, get that done. Set up a good budget for the business. So you got DEFCON 3, good, the bad, and the ugly. What's going to happen if things are a V? What happens if things are a U? What happens if things are a W? How are you going to get through this? Because you want to be the one left standing. You know, who's going to back up for you? If you get sick, who's going to take over the business and run it? Who's going to take care of billings and all that? How are you going to get the checks in the door? All those things. Do you have your lines of credit lined up? Make sure those are in place. Because I'll go back to the frog. We're not all going to survive this economically. We're going to have some people that are losers. Don't be them. Live to fight another day. That's kind of the key thing. So, you know, things you taught me. I'm already looking, I'm already looking on LinkedIn at my competitors' employees. If they lay one of them off, I might send them a little note. Hey, sorry to hear you got laid off. How's it going? Here's some stuff we're doing. You know, just to, just to touch base, just touching base. I'm looking at what my competitors are doing on their website. Are they putting good stuff on COVID up or are we? Oh, they're not doing anything on it. They're just doing simple, trite stuff. That's interesting. And then I might find their, their person I'm looking at. I'm trolling their person to figure out how to do it. So I, you know, it sounds Machiavellian, but it's the pond. If the leopard frog eats more mosquitoes, he gets the, kicks the bullfrog out of the pond. The bullfrog doesn't survive. And this is going to be one of those cases. Some of us are going to survive and some of us aren't going to thrive, you know, or not. And some of us are going to thrive. And I, I ask everybody in this new paradigm, in this new world, how are you? Oh, you froze up. Come back. Come back. Come back. Leon. So we got, uh, we got a little frozen boy going on in the new paradigm. Now, I'm always wondering if it's me or if it's the other person, right? So that keeps it fun. But I think he's going to come back. He's going to come back. Click, click, click. Doesn't work that way. Um, this dude shared so much valuable information. You can find him at Leon Labreck, L-A-B-R-E-C-Q-U-E. He's on LinkedIn. Go find him there. He's with a company called Sequoia Financial that uh, has a location here in Troy, Michigan, and they're headquartered in Akron, Ohio. So he's, uh, he's just the sharpest dude, man. Good stuff. I, uh, I really wanted to hear what he was going to say, but I like his philosophy and I like his bullfrog analogy. Ultimately, it doesn't matter. Oh, he's coming back. There he's coming go. back. Woohoo! Ah. Good. So I was, uh, I was vamping for a moment, which, you know, <laughs> turns out I'm okay with. Good. Sorry about that. That's all right. Technology. Technology. We didn't even get the porn bomb. It's, you know, it's just, <laughs> nothing, nothing good happened, except we, I'm off on a rant. We, we got me as the porn bomb. Great. <laughs> thanks. Oh, oh, great. Oh, great. Anyway, it's been great talking to you. What do you want? You want to cover anything else? Um, no, I, I, want, I, I really wanted to hear where you were going because, you know, you were, you were, in, the, you were in the pond analogy. You were, you know, at, almost at the just don't die piece. Yeah. Right. And so I don't know if you can pick back up, but that's okay. Well, no, I, I guess what I was trying to say is, is that we have to rethink our strategies. We should all be looking at our new strategies. So I literally today was working on our strategy. How are we going to digitize our client experience? Our clients are now getting used to having a digital experience. I can now set up an IRA for you and do a rollover and everything else. And we can do it just like this. I can give you the materials. We can have it done. We can have a meeting. We don't have, I don't, we don't, I don't have to come to your office. You don't have to come to my office. We're, you know, we've eliminated some of that friction. You know, how do I do some of the friction of prospect? How can I eliminate the friction of prospect? So like I'm working on a big thing right now about, you know, high level estate planning and I'm inviting a whole bunch of estate planning attorneys from all around the country and I'll get them all in one place. And it, it, it costs me nothing. I didn't even have to buy them drinks which buying tax attorneys drinks is a painful thing. So it's, it's in, there's more ways to do podcasts now and more things. So I, how do I rethink my digital marketing? What's going to change there? And then what's going to change, for example, in real estate? You know, I think real estate value is going to change. What's going to happen when a lot of these medical offices close? And what's going to happen with two real estate and rental real estate in East Lansing? And what's going to happen in a lot of spots? So where are the opportunities going to be and how does this change our lives? And if we're, if we're good business people, we're good strategists. We should be coming up with that strategy right now. What's this mean? 
And, and I, I always caution it on one important thing, Terry. When I was in 1972, to tell you how, how old I am, I was in high school and I was programming a mainframe computer to play chess. And it, it was a fruitless project because the mainframe computers in 1972 ran out of memory right after the first move. So, I mean, you literally couldn't get past the first move. And the way to, the way to program a computer to play chess is to program it on three or four levels. Start thinking on level two. Level one is how do I survive? Level two is, okay, how do I thrive? Level three is who's not going to thrive? Level four is how do I eat their lunch and take their lunch money? You know? And so it's, it's where, where is this going to go? What's going to happen you know, to doctors? And are they going to eliminate their practices or are they going to do something else? What's going to happen to rental property in East Lansing? What's going to happen to, you're an easy one. When oil is down to almost zero, is that terrible? Well, if, you're, if, you make, if you produce oil, it's terrible. If you fly a cargo airline for Amazon, it's great. If you're UPS, it's great. You know, you're making more money than ever. So it's, it's who's the winner, who's the loser, who's the leopard frog, who's the bullfrog in the pond. And my last rule is, you know, always live to fight another day. So that's what we got to do. Live to fight another day. And we'll, we'll win this. We'll win this, whether we call it a war conflict, whatever it's going to be. It's gonna, we're going to win. I just want all of us to win better. I want everybody to come through this okay. I pray that everybody makes it okay. I don't want anybody to suffer. But I don't want, you know, I think the, the right way to look at this is you've never, ever, ever seen this opportunity and never, ever seen this conflict before. You've got to put some mental aspect and some, you know, some, of, your, some of your soul into it and work. I've been saying that to my clients and anyone who will listen, man. If you don't come out of this better than you went into it, you wasted way too much time watching Tiger King. Yeah, although yeah. it is kind of fun. <laughs> I, I'm still, I'm, 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 I'm going to be that guy that didn't see it. That's my, that's my goal, man. If you watch it, you'll feel really good about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe yeah. I still feel all right about myself. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, so that was the one question that I, I had for you was, you know, what do you do in your, you're like one of the people I know that have the most eclectic tastes around everything from sacred geometry and yoga to hunting to, uh, wood sculpting and poetry and author and money and all that fun stuff. I'd ask if you learn anything new, but I'm curious if there's anything you didn't already study, you know, are you, <laughs> well, I, I did just get a ukulele. Did so you? I, I'm going to be playing the ukulele and I am working on one of my boats. So I've, I had my boat out in the driveway and I'm recarving the salmon head on one of my kayaks I built. So I'm, I'm, I'm building a boat and doing that writing my Forbes articles and I'm, Done a little bit of poetry, done a few things out there, kind of done a couple pieces, and uh, just trying to trying to keep my mind on an active, positive role. Uh, it's I, the more I th I've been reading some history, doing some other things, and then you know, a little bit of mindless stuff too. You got to do that. Gotta Absolutely. Do that. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you, uh, you did not disappoint, man. Thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you for spending the time and sharing with us, right? Yes. Uh, whoever it is that's watching this and, uh, really, really appreciate it. If, uh, I, you know, I kind of shout out LinkedIn, but where do you want people to find you? Should they want to find you, Leon? If they want to find me and they want to ask a question, um, go to Sequoia financial group and my bio is up there and I got my email up there and Drop me an email. Email is better than a call. Um, I'm, I'm inundated. Uh, if you get a chance, go look on Forbes.com, Leon Lebrecht, and look at my articles. I get a penny for them or something like that, so I can buy a, you know, I can buy a can of pop or something. But um, I'm usually trying to publish things on CARES Act and other things like that. So I, I, anybody does have a question, I'd like to help them. Go back to, you know, the starfish. I'd rather, you know, I want to make a difference to somebody in life and make sure I help them out. So I'm, I'm always willing to try to help. If I can't help, I'll try to find somebody who can. What are you what are you looking most forward to writing about when it's we don't have to talk about cares or PPP or COVID? What are you what are you looking forward to diving into next? I'm looking at the next decade and I'm looking at the demographic shifts. We we are in a demographic shift of a whole new generation of people that were raised completely different than the ones that are running things, and they're a big generation. And so I'm looking at that demographic shift and how it correlates with the technology shift and how they're gonna pay for this economic issue. So the convergence of those three cycles. Every 20 years, we have that happen. We have a convergence of a demogra demographic shift and then a technology shift and an economic shift. And I'll give you an example. Kennedy came in in 60. We had a recession in 60 and a recession in 70. Reagan came in in 80. We had a recession in 80 and a recession in 90. 
George W. came in in 2000. We had a recession in 2000. We had a recession in 2008. Trump's running again in 20. We had a recession in 20. What's going to happen in 30? So I'm looking out the decade. I'm, I'm looking out at what's, what's the next thing that happens. So when, when, I, when I can quit writing about cares, I'm going to write about what the five things millennials fear most besides running out of avocados and Starbucks. <laughs> Perfect. I'm looking forward to cool. reading that. Yes. All right, ma'am. Thank <laughs> right. you. Here, hang out for a second. I'm going to stop okay. the recording. You guys, thanks for paying attention. Follow Leon.